On this edition of Independent Sources, running out diploma mills, the full-on campaign against schools operating fraudulently in the city. Crossing the lines, the uproar over who will lead ethnic and immigrant communities now that congressional districts have been withdrawn. And ushering in a new era, a new direction for the world's leading research center on black history. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. You may have seen them while sitting in your subway car. Posters of men and women telling stories of spending thousands of dollars for a diploma that was not worth the paper it's printed on. This is a campaign called Know Before You Enroll, a collaboration between the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Mayor's Office of Adult Education. The program was started in direct response to increasing complaints from New Yorkers who were being had by schools that promised social mobility through education. These diploma mills are so rampant in the city that Crans New York recently listed them as among the top 10 frauds perpetrated in the city. I spoke with the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Adult Education about these diploma mills and how they were targeting immigrants in particular. Thank you for being in studio with us today. The Bloomberg administration quoted by the daily newsletter Cranes Insider called the problem the top consumer fraud in the city. Explain how serious this all is. So what we're looking at is the growing concern that New Yorkers are spending tens of thousands of dollars even in either in federal loans or personal loans or personal debt to enroll in education and training programs that don't yield the outcomes that they're promised. So what we're hearing is that people are enrolling after being promised quick fixes, jobs that pay six figures, they spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and too often at the end of the program the degree that they're given isn't meaningful either in finding a job, being recognized by an employer, or being able to transfer credits to another program. So we felt the need to educate New Yorkers about how to make smart choices about education and training programs and equip them with the tools they need to be able to enroll responsibly um, while they want to look to improve their skills. And this is not a new uh, problem, though, the, what, what we call the degree mills. Why now has the problem become more severe in recent years? I think there's a couple reasons. Um, one, certainly with the economy as it is, people are looking increasingly to improve their skills. People are going to find jobs and seeing that they don't have the qualifications to get perhaps the kind of job or work in the field that they're interested in. And so they're interested increasingly going back to school. I think this is a national trend across a lot of sectors. Um, but we're seeing people going back for for GEDs, for occupational certificates, for associate's degrees. At the same time, um, we're seeing more and more programs popping up to help meet that demand. Unfortunately, some of them don't have the rigor of instruction and the quality of outcomes that we'd like. And so what we're finding is that people are being um, uh, kind of hustled in and being told that there's an easy fix for something, and then at the end, it, the program just doesn't deliver. And uh, the city program that you work for is called Know Before You Enroll. Tell us specifically how you hope to address the problem. So what we're doing through Know Before You Enroll is helping New Yorkers understand the issues around student lending, making choices about training programs, how to get help if they have incurred debt, um, as well as how to compare their options. And so we've created a testimonial ad campaign featuring real New Yorkers sharing their stories, essentially saying, here's what happened to me. I had a bad experience or I feel like I got ripped off, um, here's how I got help or what I wish I had known, here's what you can do. And so we're encouraging New Yorkers to call 311 or go to nyc.gov to compare their options when looking at a training provider, reading student reviews, looking at how much it will actually cost, making sure they understand that financial aid is most times actually loans. It's not free money. It's money that you have to pay back with interest. We're finding that a lot of people are unaware of that very important detail. Um, and we're also telling people that if they've had a bad experience to file a complaint with the city so that the complaint can be forwarded on to the enforcement agencies at the state level to take appropriate action. A few months ago, uh, when you actually launched the pro 
program, program. you had a, a campaign of advertising uh, in, in the subway. Mm -hmm. Telling mo tell us more about that. Well, so we felt that the most powerful way to help us get our message out was to have real New Yorkers share what had happened to them. And so we found um, several dozen people who were willing to share what their experiences were, you know, admit that they had been in some ways um, lied to or suckered and that they felt that they didn't have a, a good um, experience and, and they wanted to help protect other New Yorkers by sharing what happened to them. And so we feature four people, um, two young men and two older women, and, um, and really just, you know, you see that their stories run the gamut from um, one woman who went to a school that was an absolutely illegal, unlicensed, fraudulent school that took $6,000 of her money in cash and she wasted 11 months of her time and didn't get any closer to her dream of becoming a nurse. No, another young man took out $19,000 in loans at a school that promised they would help him get a job. He got the degree and at the end he found that the skills he had learned were largely worthless. Um, he couldn't transfer his credits to another institution. He couldn't find a job and he since defaulted on his loan. He now owes $25,000 and has very little to show for it. So we just thought it was the most powerful messages were from real New Yorkers um, to help uh, make sure that other people who may be in similar circumstances understand what they should consider before they sign on the dotted line. Speaking of advertising, how big a role does advertising play for uh, schools who may be unlicensed uh, f to attract people? For unlicensed schools, we don't know um, because it's such a, um, an unknown area. We don't know how many there are. We, we think there could be as many as hundreds throughout the five boroughs. I believe that with unlicensed schools, it's more often than not word of mouth, people hearing through the grapevine that there's a program or a school that they can go to. But we know that in general, when people um, only know about one or two different education and training options, they don't feel equipped to be able to make an informed choice. They might just choose the program or the, the school that's closest to them or that they heard about, but it might not be the right fit for them or it might cost much more than they're financially able to bear. You see in uh, subways uh, pretty often advertisements for various types of, uh, of schools. Uh, are they um, schools that, could they be schools that are unlicensed? No, I think almost every single one of the ones that advertises on the subway is a licensed school. And one of the things that I think is important about this campaign is that we, we think that there's really a spectrum of educational providers, whether they're for-profit, not-profit, um, private. We think there are a lot of really great for-profit providers out there, schools out there, many of whom you know are offering a top-notch education. Unfortunately, there's a growing number of bad actors in that industry. And so we're helping to make, you know, let New Yorkers know how to protect themselves. We also know that having a license isn't enough to feel equipped to just say, you know, sign me up. We want people to make sure they ask smart questions, ask to sit in on a class, ask if their credits will transfer, ask how much their monthly loan payment will be, make sure they know the answers to those questions before they sign up. And don't feel pressured, I guess, is the last thing I would say. You know, people often talk about signing up the day they go, being told, you know, you got to get in tomorrow, we, we, we got to get you in. And, and I think that one of our messages is trust your gut. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Given that most people who fall prey to these kind of schools are immigrants, are you at all reaching or considering to reach out to community leaders to, to make the bridge with these people? Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations and really good um, meetings with different leaders, community-based organizations, people who work throughout the five boroughs. We have materials for this campaign translated into eight languages. Um, we're going to begin doing some advertising in community and ethnic newspapers because we know that people, um, you know, we need to reach people where they're getting their information and whether it's through their faith-based organization, through a community center, through the local paper that they read, we want to make sure we get the message out. Is there a particular recourse for people who have fallen prey to these schools to get their money back? Um, it, it, honestly, it really depends. Um, it depends on the nature of what happened. It depends on the type of program and whether it was licensed or not. What we're encouraging New Yorkers to do is to call 311, which they can do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are operators that speak 175 languages. They can file a complaint anonymously. Um, but we really want to make sure that they're telling us what's happening so we can then share that with the appropriate enforcement agencies. Unfortunately, m most times it's, it's very difficult to get your money back unless there's been very egregious offenses committed. Um, so that's part of why we're trying to make sure we get a message out to people before they sign up to help them understand what the consequences are. For people who have um, incurred a lot of debt and are struggling with it, we're also encouraging them to go to the city's financial empowerment centers, which they can find out about also by calling 311. Those are free counseling centers where people can get one-on-one -on 
one-on-one -on -one professional counseling about their financial circumstances, get help managing their debt, making a budget, understanding how much debt they even took out. Um, we're finding that a lot of people don't even know how much they have in loans or what their monthly payments are. Tara Colton, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You can learn more about the Know Before You Enroll program by visiting the city's website, www.nyc.gov, or by calling 311. Still to come on the show, how will the redrawing of congressional districts impact ethnic and immigrant communities? Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From World Journal, many Chinese restaurant owners are in a state of confusion regarding the city's restaurant health grading system. Restaurant insiders are complaining that there's a lack of clarity in the rules. They also say that tickets are issued erratically and it's becoming expensive to fight violations. Chinese chefs are also finding it hard to conform to rules on cooking since the traditional preparation for many ethnic dishes conflicts with city standards. Wellington Chen, the executive vice president of the Chinatown Partnership, spoke on behalf of Chinese restaurant owners who were too afraid to testify against the health department at a recent hearing held this month. The Forward reports that one pro-Israel organization run by Jews is creating a more diverse following. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee has a new batch of supporters that include Christian evangelicals, African Americans, Latinos, and student leaders from some top universities. The group saw that Jewish support would no longer be enough to carry its pro-Israel message once the number of their non-Orthodox Jewish donors shrank. This as the population of Jews in America decreased from 3.5 percent of the population in 1940 to currently 2.1 percent. From Voices of New York, Lincoln Health Center in the Bronx is allowing artists to trade their talent for health care. The program called the Lincoln Art Exchange is a barter system that invites people to share artwork, performances, or activities with patients at the facility. In return, artists earn points towards expensive medical procedures. This as the national debate on health care continues. And finally, the Independent reports that jazz musicians in New York have launched a campaign to get employer-paid benefits. According to the Independent, jazz musicians who belong to the American Federation of Musicians, Local 802, are treated like second-class citizens. Yet most symphony and Broadway performers in the same union have medical benefits and pensions. Jazz musicians have started a campaign to get major clubs to sign agreements that would set a minimum pay rate, create a pension plan, and design a process to settle disputes with club owners and artists. Jazz musicians are also asking for royalties for club recordings. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Gary and Vianora in the studio. Thanks, Abby. It happens after every census, the redrawing of congressional district lines to match the demographic breakdowns revealed by new figures. The process has historically been fraught with controversy, so much so that it gave birth to a new word, gerrymandering, back in 1812. That's when an ambitious Massachusetts governor, Eldridge Gerry, sought to redraw district lines to suit his political needs. Is history, as they say, repeating itself? This time, the leadership of several ethnic and immigrant enclaves is at stake. Already one Ford Green Assemblyman, Hakeem Jeffries, has complained about the new lines, while Brooklyn's borough president, Marty Markowitz, is considering running against Yvette Clark in a traditionally African-American and West Indian district, now that the new borders include a larger Jewish community. So what do the new lines mean for representation in these districts? I sat down with journalists Ari Kagan and Esmeralda Simmons of the Center for Law and Social Justice to talk about the issue. Esmeralda, why is everyone up in arms against redistricting in New York State? Uh, because what the legislative did, uh, the state legislature, the assembly, the senate, and the governor, what they did was what everyone had asked them not to do. Which they was? gerrymandered again. I mean, straight politics, you get yours, I'll get mine. You know, they threw the pension in to make sure that they would do what the, what folks wanted them to do. And then the governor who promised to veto did not veto. That's why people are up in arms. That's why we're in court. That's why the state legislature is being challenged. Those lines are being challenged right now. And people are going down to the Justice Department, to the courts in D.C. They're in the courts in Brooklyn. And uh, 
I don't think this is over yet. Well, before we get into the implication uh, of, of, of this process, let's talk a little bit about the process. How did it happen? What happened exactly? If we are talking about like South Brooklyn, for example, and 27th Senate, uh, Senatorial District, uh, it was cut by, uh, into four pieces, four, uh, at least not like 50, you know. For example, I live at Brighton Beach, and Brighton Beach is united in the, the same senatorial district with North Shore of Staten Island. Uh, Shipset Bay was very unlucky in this process. It was cut in five pieces, I believe. One of the pieces was united uh, with East New York and Canarsie and Starred City. Uh, another piece was united with uh, Dacker Heights and Bay Ridge, for example. Also, it was uh, one of the pieces of 27th district was put to the so-called new super Jewish district. It's all about politics because Republicans wanted uh, to reward uh, Orthodox Jews uh, because they voted last year for Bob Turner, so they promised them they will Bob create Turner, super Jewish district. Bob Turner ran for Congress and yes. from the, to replace and Anthony Weiner. That's the 11th district, right? Correct. But okay. now. Like it, I'm not talking about now about congressional districts. I'm talking about senatorial districts, state senate district. If you wanted to talk about congressional district, I can tell you, it's also horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Is this strictly politics along uh, partisan lines? Because on the one hand, you have people like Akeem Jeffries, who has seen his potential district decimated from under him. He wanted to run against Ed Towns, and then you have Yvette Clark. Now with Marty Markowitz uh, talking about getting into the race. So is this a long partisan line or I, I, I'm I, confused? I, you know, yeah, well, I, things have moved along. I mean, this, this thing is like a runaway train. So now Markowitz says he's supporting, uh, he's supporting uh, uh, Yvette Clark and he's not going to run in any state senate or assembly or congressional district against Ed Town. Um, uh, I haven't heard any major complaints against by uh, Assemblyman uh, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, except before the congressional lines would, would, were redrawn by the court. And I must say, I was very happy that the court adopted most of the suggestions that um, the unity map, which my office worked on, uh, suggested. So we told them to put Fort Greene back mm -hmm. in with Bed-Stuy um, uh, going toward the east and not to, to make it go toward the south into the Crown Heights area, and that's what they did. Uh, so they reunited that part of Brooklyn that's, that has been united for a long time. So I think that Hakeem Jeffries is in the same situation, basically, he was before the election. Uh, be, I'm sorry, before redistricting. And he if, he, if he chooses to run, he chooses to run. By the way, uh, my organization, we don't draw lines for incumbents. We draw lines for voters. Uh, that's why I hear what he's saying, because everyone thinks this is about who's running or whatever. No, it's about where the people live, keeping communities together and making sure that the pattern of the district follow the migratory pattern of New Yorkers. And that's something that I'm happy to say a federal court could understand. I don't think the legislature even has ears at this point. <laughs> you know, historically, it has been said that only someone from a, a particular group is best able to represent that group. And I think this is an underlying issue here. Is this true? Uh, it's not true, but the question is not whether it's true or not. The question is like, uh, for example, whether Brighton Beach uh, should be in the same congressional district with East New York. Uh, do you think this this completely different district with very different demographics, with very different, I would say, income level, and very different problems should be united to the same congressional district? Uh, I believe it's not about Gerald Nadler, whom I respect a lot. But he's no longer representing Brighton Beach. Now it's a town's district, you know. And we can get, for example, my good friend Charles Barham, who hates Israel, and I love Israel, and Brighton <laughs> Beach is very Jewish district, and everybody does it, does loves, he, this, loves really Israel, and he oh, hates no, Israel. That's because he's running for that safe does, He's yeah. running for this. He could be my congressman. Has, as he, as he, has he been on the record saying he hates Israel, or he has a very strong opinion that may, people may, may misconstrue as being. Hate, hate, hatred of Israel. Anybody who says that uh, Gaza is a new Auschwitz to me is an enemy of Israel and enemy of Jews. That's to me. Okay. Because Auschwitz is a Holocaust, and I feel very strongly about Holocaust. My grandmother was killed in Minsk ghetto, and believe me, Gaza is not Auschwitz. Okay, that's a side issue, but let's get back to <laughs> yeah. redistricting. You said earlier, Esmeralda, that 
this doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, why break up these districts? Because they make absolutely no sense. As Ari has said, what does East New York and Brighton Beach have in common? And not geographically, nothing. So why did they put these? Well, they didn't put those together. Who put that's them together? A, that's the court. The court put them together. Because they couldn't agree between themselves. Thank you. Federal court started Thank to you. become involved. And, and the commonality was, is not re, uh, uh, between East New York, Brownsville, and, and, uh, and Coney Island, or Brighton Beach. It is basically the waterfront. That's mm -hmm. what they did. Um, they pulled that all in and grabbed that whole waterfront all along the East Coast and put that in one district. And uh, that was not the district that Ed Towns wanted um, either. So uh, nobody's happy. Except I'm pretty happy because I think that the way it turned out is that even though some many communities were broken up, many communities were also kept together. And the court was paying attention to what was going on in terms of the migratory patterns. What, what people are upset about is the Senate lines and the fact that they put another district in where did they put it in the place where all the population is growing no they put it near buffalo which has lost population consistently in the last and new york city years. has gained population Absol largely to immigrants Absol coming yes, into the city exactly so this is that that again is another very partisan ploy to put uh, to diminish the voting power of people in, in the lower part of the state, particularly New York City, uh, particularly the Democratic New York City, and to uh, obviously empower folks upstate that are conservative where they think they can get, get a, a seat. And they're fighting for their lives because they want to hold on to the Senate. And when they lost it a few years ago, I don't think they quite got over that. Is this peculiar to New York? Where else this is happening? I believe it's, uh, I would say, politics at worst. I believe that the uh, federal judge started to look at the congressional lines only because uh, Democrats and Republicans in state legislature couldn't agree. And in terms of state Senate lines, I believe it's all cynical ploy by Republicans who, who wanted to preserve their ma majority in the state Senate. They didn't care, like, they're putting neighborhoods, communities into any kind of pieces. They didn't care about, much about anybody, just wanted to preserve their majority for the next 10 years. And where is this independent redistricting commission? And governor got seven casinos as a result. Governor got DNA <laughs> database, etc., etc. He got what he wanted from them, and then he's, he signed this cynical uh, plot by Republicans. What does the governor getting casino approval have to do with Redistricting. <laughs> I, I can tell you. I can tell you. He, for time. That's very interesting question. <laughs> he said, "I need this, this, and this." You know, and like uh, a republic. Pension is even more important. Uh, I, I forgot. Yeah, pension yeah, reform. He got pension that, reform. Pension reform. You know, they, they voted for pension reform, and so he got everything he wanted from legislature. Legislature wanted only one thing: to this, his signature uh, on the new lines. Everybody is happy, besides people of New York State. Well, I don't think the legislators are so happy anymore because the, the unions have the unions who have supported them to be reelected, uh, their campaigns are now saying find somebody else to get your money for. I think this is going to be a very interesting battle in 2012. But the people who are going to hurt the most are the folks who have been relying on the unions, and most of those are the Democrats. So either way, we'll see what happens with that. We'll see what happens with that. I don't know if there's going to be any kissing and making up because that tier six is a major departure. I'm, we're talking about a pension plan that doesn't give people a pension. All right. <laughs> Repu Republicans signed the pledge, publicly pledge. They would do it only with independent redistricting commission. Every single one of them broke this pledge. Ari Kagan, you have the last word. Hmm. Thank you very much. Esmeralda Simmons, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we learn about plans at the Schomburg Center to put more black culture on display. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. 
This problem is closer than you think. But so is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Finally from us tonight, Dr. Khalil Gibran Mohammed has a famous last name. His grandfather was the Nation of Islam leader Elijah Mohammed. Now the former professor is hoping to make his own mark in the history books as he takes over the reins of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Sure. The center is considered the world's leading resource for research on the black experience. It's been around for more than 80 years and is actually a unit of the New York Public Library. Dr. Mohammed succeeds Howard Johnson Jr., who held the post for 25 years. The Chicago native knows he has big shoes to fill and has equally big plans for the center. We recently spoke about some of those plans and the challenges ahead. Last summer, Dr. Khalil Gibran Mohammed began his tenure as director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. The Schomburg is a unit of the New York Public Library. It's known as one of the world's leading research institutions on African American, Caribbean, and African history and culture. Recently, I sat down with Dr. Mohammed and spoke about his plans for the venerable Harlem Institution. The biggest challenge is continuing to argue and advocate for the value of cultural institutions, particularly um, the ones that matter to black people. Um, the humanities in general uh, in this country and around the world uh, are, not, um, are not getting the attention they deserve, not getting the financial support they deserve. Globalization is chewing up um, old models of philanthropy, old models of economic development. And as a consequence of that, whether it's in higher education, whether it's in local school districts, or whether it's libraries, uh, budgets are shrinking. And my commitment is to making sure that the Schomburg remains a going concern, uh, that the lights stay on, that we continue to collect and preserve material. The challenges facing Dr. Mohammed are numerous, but he believes that his passion and dedication to amplify black voices across the world will make his task manageable. The Schomburg's mission is also twofold preserve and increase its resources while leading it into uncharted new media territory so that it can attract young visitors. The research library model has tended to favor academics, writers, and artists using material for creative production. And uh, because this is a very unique place with two exhibition galleries, one in the front and one in the back, uh, we have an opportunity to create a kind of uh, children's museum exhibit and installing something permanent here. What that means is that um, given that we have museum space in the building, we have a chance to create exhibitions that focus specifically on addressing young people, say, from the ages of 5 to 15. That's something that the center has never actively done before. Dr. Mohammed is himself a father of three young children. He knows that to bring in the young audience, he must first bring in the adults. It also means giving their parents and grandparents a reason to come here. We have two exhibitions, one on Romare Beard and one on Malcolm X. And during the opening night, I said to those in attendance, I said, please come back with uh, your young charges. Because the truth is that for those who were in the room, they were all adults, some of them seasoned veterans. And um, we're not passing on the value of our heritage. With an operating budget of nearly $7 million, the Schomburg depends on both private and public donations to acquire new materials. Dr. Mohammed has to constantly convince donors of the relevance of this institution. He has ambitious plans to acquire papers and artifacts of prominent black leaders. I certainly have the stomach for making a case for why this place is extremely important and that no one in this position and no one who has a chance to hear what I have to say wants to end up on the wrong side of history and saying, well, I had a chance to, to help the Schomburg out and I chose otherwise. For Independent Sources, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Until the next time, be independent-minded. 